Let me jump forward uh, uh, because of the time pressures we're under. Uh, after all these years of success and accomplishment and achievement in Congress, uh, all of a sudden, seemingly out of the blue, you get this offer to be the head of the United Negro College Fund and you leave. Tell, tell us about that. Well, I know that that was a shocking choice to most Americans, uh, that here's a guy who in 12 years goes from a freshman to chairman of the Budget Committee to chairman of the Democratic Caucus and to majority whip, which is the one-way ticket to speakership. Uh, Tip O'Neill had been majority whip. Uh, Tom Foley had been majority whip. Uh, and you're on your way. Uh, and suddenly, I walk away from it and say, after 12 years, I want to go do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew people would not understand, all people. Uh, there were all kind of speculations about why Bill Gray is doing it. You know, some people said he's in trouble, there's an, maybe an investigation going on. And I tried to say, no, that's not the case uh, at all. And, uh, well, one newspaper wrote that I was going through a midlife crisis mm -hmm. <laughs> on Capitol Hill. And uh, I said, well, that's, my wife's been saying that for a long time. I've been going through that kind of crisis. I've always been a minister, and I've been about change. If you're going to understand Bill Gray, understand, first of all, no, he's not a politician. He is a Baptist minister. I continue to do that. That's the one job I've never left in all of my days. While I was in Congress, I'd go back and preach at Bright Hope. I'm still pastor of the Bright Hope Baptist Church. This year will be my 29th year as pastor of that church. Before that, I was eight years at the Union Baptist Church in Montclair, New Jersey. So if you want to understand me, understand my ministry first. And then an extension of that ministry is education. An extension of that ministry is social change and justice in the public policy area. Uh, because a lot of us who were part of that school uh, that came along in the 60s, uh, once we brought down the walls of segregation, the fight turned to public policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the Poor People's Campaign was about. It was about voter registration. It was about that's where the new arena was. I saw my role as an agent of change to do it for a while and then leave it. I never wanted to be president. I never wanted to be uh, any other political office. I thought about the possibility of being speaker, but I knew that was going to be 15 years. Mm -hmm. I was 50 years old. And I'm a black basketball player from the inner city of Philadelphia. We don't like to sit on the bench for 15 mm -hmm. years. We like to play. And I didn't think that that was going to be good for me. And since I had no other national aspirations, I didn't want to be mayor, I didn't want to be governor, senator, or uh, president, uh, this opportunity came along. And I said, you know, it's an opportunity to go back to where you were 20 years ago in education, go back to some roots, and also at a critical time in the black community. Because at that point, uh, I saw what I believed was an explosion of growth of black young people who were going to complete high school, who were going to go to college. And the Dukes, the North Carolinas, the Harvards, the Haverfords, the Swarthmores, the Franklin and Marshalls are not going to take them all. They're going to take the cream of the crop. And these black colleges, which used to educate the cream of the crop, would now have a new mission. And they were going to need the resources to do that. And the United Negro College Fund has been about the business of providing the resources for these colleges for 56 years. And you know something about fundraising. You've been pretty successful at it as a Baptist preacher, as a politician. And what better way to close out your life other than as a minister than to go and raise money to make it possible for these schools to widen their doorways so that the thousands of young black kids who can't afford and won't get the scholarship aid that they need to go to the elite prestigious schools can go to these very fine institutions that have been producing some of the best leadership the black community has seen ever. And so that's why I left. I didn't expect people to understand it. I got all kinds of scathing letters, all kinds of innuendo. And I've learned in life you can't convince people about your choices. You do what's right for you, what your faith and what the Lord leads you to do. You prayed about it. Your wife, family, you've talked about it. Go do it and let the chips fall. And sure enough, people said, gee, the, Nothing did happen. There was nothing in an investigation. Gee, uh, God, it's a good thing he made the decisions he did. 
uh, he would have been the minority whip today. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what led me to do it, is that I wanted to pursue a different path, which was to help these historically black colleges raise the money that was going to be needed for a new generation of leaders for a new millennium.